Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. It's a tremendous honor to be here at Google. I'm really in awe of the speakers who have preceded me on this podium. There are so many writers and thinkers and men and women of action who have been part of the Google Talk series. Most of them have presented some very specific area of knowledge or even wisdom, or they've talked about how to do something in particular. Um, as a writer, what I have to offer is story and language, and that's it. There's not going to be a takeaway, because art is the marriage of content and form, and form cannot be retold or summarized. So I'm going to read to you from my book for single mothers working as train conductors, which some readers and critics have described as an essay collection. Some have said it's a book-length essay. Some call it a memoir. That's my publisher, because they say that essay collection is the marketing kiss of death. Um, some call it a story collection, but it really is an essay collection. Um, but whatever you call it, um, it takes up a, a grab bag of subjects that are obsessions for me. Translation, untranslatability. I've actually I've um, forged a new path in essay writing. There are a lot of essays about translation, but I am the first writer I know who writes about not translating. I realized after this book came out that it has two essays in it that are about books that I decided not to translate and why. And I have, an, I have another one in mind. Um, and I've been told that when you write from your own life, uh, you will only ever write one book. This was something that a writing teacher thundered at me when I was young and I was turning in a story that was purported to be fiction but clearly was not. But I think I found the solution because if you write about books you have not translated, you will never <laughs> run out of material. Um, so the obsessions that I take up in this book, translation on translatability, uh, Russian, French, and Yiddish culture, literature, and uh, language. I worked with French and Russian at the UN. I did not work with Yiddish at the UN. Other obsessions include Judaism, marriage and divorce, and chronic illness. I'm going to tell you the story, which is one section of For Single Mothers Working as Train Conductors, uh, which is a highly subjective, even quirky account of my experiences being hired as a new staff employee at the United Nations. This piece takes up some other subjects as well, but they're all subsumed under the heading of the resistance and grief that we human beings display when we're unwillingly going through life transitions. And in this case, it's the transition from a high-flying international career as a diplomatic and conference interpreter of Russian and English to a desk job requiring minimal knowledge of a few languages before I transitioned into a job as a translator working with documents in Russian, French, and Spanish. Another transition it describes is the transition from the freedom of self-employment to being a tiny cog in an immense bureaucracy. And both of those transitions were occasioned by a different transition which was the transition from health to chronic illness. Now, this is a worm's eye view of what it's like to work at the United Nations. And it's not terribly favorable. So I'll give you some background, some context. But before I get to that, I want to say that there is a kind of open secret about my book which I'll share with you. It's something that authors are always enjoined not to say about their work, but I'm a debut author. I haven't mastered the protocols and the etiquette, so I can say whatever I want now until my second book comes out, which I don't think will be anytime soon. This one took over a decade. And that open secret is that my book is autobiographical. I don't know why this is often associated with shame for writers, and many writers 
will do almost, they will stand on their head to avoid admitting this even if it's true. The pedigree of autobiographical writing is superb. Everything from uh, Augustine's Confessions, Lord, make me chaste but not yet, to The Little House on the Prairie, to Remembrance of Things Past, which you'll hear more about in a moment. Um, these are some of my favorite books. But um, I, am, I cannot hide the fact that my work is autobiographical. It's transparently clear. I live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. My narrator lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. I worked as an interpreter and translator of Russian, French, and Spanish. And my narrator worked as an interpreter and translator of Russian, French, and Spanish. I have a chronic degenerative lung disease. My narrator has a chronic, well, you, you get the idea. Um, I, but even though it's won a prize for literary nonfiction, this book and my writing in general embraces subjectivity, memory lapses, hearsay, and speculation. And as such, it should not, it cannot and should not be fact-checked. Um, its purpose is to tell a story, not to say, here's what happened. I would compare it to a retouched photograph. Um, so getting back to the United Nations, I said I wanted to give you some context because of the unfavorable impression that my reading may give you. I believe in the United Nations. I believe in its mission. I believe in multilateralism. But many of my UN coworkers and I have a sneaking sympathy for that famous remark by John Bolton, who was George W. Bush's uh, ambassador to the United Nations, when he said that if the top 10 stories of the United Nations Secretariat should suddenly disappear, nobody would miss them. And our sympathy for this remark has nothing to do with our politics. Uh, you would have to search high and low to find a staffer at the UN who supported George W. Bush, let alone Trump. Um, it has more to do with the way the organization is run sometimes. Um, the UN is in desperate need of reform. That reform will probably never take place. Um, but it is nonetheless a really necessary and indispensable organization. Uh, and one of the problems is that because its ideals are so lofty, when it inevitably fails, that failure seems even greater than it is. But um, to get back to the top 10 story, stories of the, of the Secretariat building, I think one of the reasons my colleagues and I would not be sorry if it disappeared is because it houses, among many other things, the Human Resources Department, <laughs> And to get hired at the UN, which in my case took several years, you have to jump through so many hoops and go through a ridiculous uh, gauntlet to prove your qualifications. I actually had to come in with a rolling suitcase that contained all of the books I had translated so they could estimate how many words I had translated during my previous decade and a half as a translator. And this kind of thing causes people to start their work at the UN already with an enormous chip on their shoulder toward their employer. There are some good things at the, in the top 10 stories of the UN. There is a restroom that has a stunning view of Midtown uh, Manhattan for women only. Um, although I'm told that it's been used as a, a viewing post to look down on the roofs of lower buildings nearby when couples are trysting and they're unaware that they're visible. Um, it also has a locked room on the top floor, reachable only by a creaky, twisting staircase that contains nothing else but a ping pong table. And this is one flight up from the Secretary General's office. The ping pong table room is a place where diplomats go late at night when they're locked uh, deadlocked, I should say, in talks. They bang the little ball around to blow off steam before they go back to the negotiation table. One hopes to achieve better results. Um, so the UN does everything it can to reduce international tensions. And in that connection, 
I do think that the United Nations is important and indispensable. It's the only place in the world where all 193 countries can come together to discuss everything that needs to be discussed from uh, sexual violence in conflict to food insecurity to border control, counterterrorism, how to stop female genital mutilation, and the human rights of women, ethnic and racial minorities, people with disabilities, uh, and children. I don't agree with those people who say we should turn our backs on the UN and instead found an institution that's for democracies only. I think that would be very, very problematic. I think that the non-democracies are precisely the countries that need to be kept in the loop and in the discussion. Furthermore, I'm not sure who would decide which countries are democracies. Is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea a democracy? Some people obviously think so. The Democratic Republic of Congo, also known as the international capital of rape. Um, and then there are countries whose democratic credentials have been burnished for centuries that seem to be veering toward other forms of rule. And there are democracies that become authoritarian and then one hopes return to democracy. Are they going to join this hypothetical organization, then be expelled, and then reapply for admission when they return to democracy? So with these unanswered questions, um, I will now read to you Proust at Rush Hour. Um, there are two things you need to know, because this is not quite at the beginning of the book. It references uh, the lung disease, which I was diagnosed with in the course of working as a contractor at the UN and undergoing all the processes for becoming a staffer. And it also references my bid for that job, which was a bid for financial and professional security. So Proust at rush hour. My job is a drag, like most nine to five gigs, I imagine. But oh, the commute. The commute is a golden border at the beginning and end of each workday that sheds some of its shimmer onto the leaden expanse in between. I should add that I wrote this a few months after I became a permanent staffer, and I didn't realize until a few years later that it was actually a lament for the lost freedom of self-employment. So, but oh, the commute. The commute is a golden border at the beginning and end of each workday that sheds some of its shiv shimmer onto the leaden expanse in between. I'm a New Yorker, so taking the subway to work is a given. The subway provides in miniature all of the charms of long distance train travel, minus the view. There is the unencumbered time, a commodity beyond price for those who sell their waking hours in order to afford a place to sleep. There is the heady state of in-betweenness a brief release from all worldly entanglement. There is the fact that subway travel is, for now at least, incompatible with email and cell phones, and that it will always be incompatible with vacuuming, dishes, and laundry. There are about half a dozen things, tops, that you can do on the subway. Doze, observe the people around you, listen to music, read, think, things we should all do more often. I was not always a commuter. I used to be self-employed. I worked from home, and when I traveled, my conveyance of choice was the jet plane, state banquets at the Kremlin, mafia trials, forgotten literary masterpieces, KGB files declassified under Yeltsin to be reclassified later under Putin. I translated them all. It was a halcyon time. The border between working and not working was porous. When work was slow, I took a walk or a yoga class. When a deadline loomed, I worked weekends or evenings. As to why people dreaded Monday and thanked God it was Friday, I lacked all understanding. When people spoke of their commutes, I listened as to an account of some quaint foreign ritual. But in my mid-30s, panic bore down. My health insurance was patchy my retirement savings meager, my income blossomed and shriveled with the seasons. I began planning 
for the transition from free spirit to commuter, boning up on my French so as to get that job I'd set my sights on. Apart from the expense, there was nothing onerous in this. Who would object to spending some months in Paris immersed in the language of Molière and Serge Gainsbourg? This was a dream I had nurtured and then set aside almost 20 years before, and I was glad of any pretext to make it come true at last. French mastered, I prepared to take up my new job as an interpreter of Russian and French into English, working in a tall building of green glass at Midtown Manhattan's eastern edge. And now unforeseen things began to happen. During the trial period before the job was to become permanent, my newly failing lungs made it difficult, then impossible, for me to perform that demanding work. A seemingly firm job offer went limp. Through a series of short contracts within the organization, I tumbled down and down in status and job satisfaction, though not salary until I landed in a permanent position editing English language documents with duties that called for no more than a passing knowledge of French or any other foreign language. Movement up the hierarchy, I would come to understand, was the reward for a different sort of fluency altogether, directly proportionate to the climber's ability to say nothing and offend no one in the most elegant way possible all at great length. Shortly after I started the permanent job, I was copied on an email from one higher up to another, its contents presumably affecting my future in some way, that embodied the style so utterly that I would be remiss if I did not re reproduce it here. Quote, while I do not think that your concern is misplaced, ran this missive, I would say that it may be premature to suggest that the guidelines would apply uniformly as they stand to all staff. I hope I am not being overly sanguine about this, but I tend to think that just as our specificities are being taken into account to a large extent in the interim, they would readily be accommodated in the long term. In other words, the guidelines only state the policy which will no doubt allow for some special dispensation. However, I do not dispute for a second that yours is a legitimate concern. When I got this, this is just an aside, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but it seemed like such a fantastic example of something that I printed it out to save. And then later I found this use for it. But I reminded myself as I printed out the email and taped it to the wall over my computer between a map of the economic community of West African states and another of the former Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, I was lucky. At, at last, I had a permanent job. It came with health insurance, which saved me thousands each month on crucial prescriptions, medical equipment rentals and doctor visits, disability benefits if I became unable to work, a possibility I now had to entertain, dental coverage so dazzling that even the receptionist at the dentist's office was impressed. Liberal sick leave, of which I would take full advantage. A sun-splashed office with a view of boats chugging up and down the East River. Access to a post office, bank, credit union, employee only, low interest mortgages, medical service, international newsstand, yoga, dancer size and Pilates classes, a cappuccino bar, cafeteria, fancy restaurant with enormous bowls of whipped cream and raspberries on the all you can eat dessert buffet, nine levels of instruction at no cost in my choice of Spanish, Arabic, or Mandarin, and high school choirs visiting from the heartland, singing songs of international peace and brotherhood. All this right on the premises, all mine, in exchange for spending my days doing nothing, or what felt like nothing. Where would I find something better? Indeed, I often ask myself that question. Although my Russian and my newly acquired French are, as noted, superfluous in the job where I've ended up, the hiring process mysteriously included an eight-hour language proficiency test. And just as mysteriously, the word translator figures prominently in my title, 
With some luck, in a few years, I might transfer back to a post where foreign languages could prove useful. In the meantime, I've decided to read Proust, yes, in search of lost time, also known as remembrance of things past. In the original French, all of it, seven volumes, on the subway, standing up. Here's the drill. In the morning, I get to the subway platform, pull out the book, and open to the page where I left off the previous evening when the subway doors glided apart at my stop. It's a fine edition with the thinnest of paper, the title tooled in gilt on the spine, and a slender grosgrain bookmark sewn in, also gilt. Failure to get the volume into position before the train pulls in means I may not get to do any reading that morning, as it's often too crowded to fumble in my bag for the book after I board. Other things to do before I push my way onto the train, lay my hands on a pen in my bag and make sure the sticky note inside the book's back cover has not come unglued and fallen out. The pen and the little yellow scrap of paper are for writing down unfamiliar words. If I don't have a pen at the ready, or if the sticky note is missing or already filled with scrawls from previous commutes, I'll go back later, reread the pages, and write down the unfamiliar words that I didn't capture on the first pass. Then I'll look up, look them up during the slow moments of, at the office that add up to a work day, and another, and another. The office with the river view is awash in battered foreign language dictionaries that, it, that appear to have languished there for decades. If it weren't for Proust and my compulsion to look up every single unfamiliar word I come across, they would get very little use indeed. Here are a few entries from my Proust word list. Mossad, Minodier, Andine, Alambique, Mièvre, Oyer, Allégresse, Goûter, Gazouiller, Tapissier, Scélératesse, Entremetteuse, Bristol, and Lévrier, meaning respectively sullen, simpering, water sprite, convoluted, mawkish, carnation, jubilation, tea party, to warble, upholsterer, villainy, procurus, calling card, and greyhound. I'm on the 7th Avenue Express now, hurtling downtown. In one hand, I hold the book, and in the other, the pen, so I cannot properly be called a strap hanger. I assume a wide stance, bend my knees, and ride the train like a skateboard. In the 12 minutes or so it takes the train to barrel down the line from 96th Street to Times Square, I fight inertia's, inertia's pull toward free fall into some stranger's lap, plunging instead into the bucolic village of Cambrai or the Paris salons and cafes where representatives of the haute bourgeoisie and the demi-monde cross paths. I read Proust almost exclusively on the subway on weekends, I rarely pick up the book. The little volume with the grosgrain marker lies untouched on my desk from Friday evening, time of unseemly rejoicing, until Monday morning, time of dread beyond reason. This runs counter to my notion of myself as someone with an almost religious reverence for literature and its greats. But there it is. My life yields up few moments that are conducive to the concentration and discipline that Proust requires. Every week or two, I indulge in a dalliance with some other author. This some take, sometimes takes place on the subway, but mostly off. When I read on the down low, it's always in English. No need to keep a running lookup list with the attendant pen and post-it note. Usually the work of some contemporary author whose style is relatively terse, though compared to Proust, Proust everything seems terse. I can tear through a contemporary novel of two to three hundred pages in the time it takes to read 25 to 30 pages of Proust. Read in brief spurts, Proust's 3,000 pages, well, the 700 I've read so far, reveal, reveal themselves to be a series of hundreds and hundreds of linked discursive essays, two to five pages long. Here is a description of a bouquet of chrysanthemums in Madame Swan's chambers, which segues into mention of a sunset whose color is similar to the flowers, which doglegs into a discussion of how her former life 
as a kept woman with a sideline in prostitution, nurtured in Odette, as she's known to her numerous intimates, a taste for a range of luxury goods delivered to her door from exclusive establishments spanning many arrondissements. Here is a discussion of the difference between the face a famous writer presents at a dinner party and his interior life as laid bare in his books, and of the young narrator's astonishment at the contrast between the two aspects of the man whose work he has long admired, a contrast so marked that he thinks the party guest must in fact be some other writer who coincidentally bears the same name. Here is a meditation on a musical phrase that lodges in Swan's memory after repeating repeated hearings. Here is Times Square. I almost missed it, engrossed in a description of the acacia trees and the public toilet on the Champs-Élysées where, near where Marcel and Gilbert play hide and seek after school. I pause mid-sentence, ride the human wave off the train and come to rest on the platform. Later, when I resume reading, I will cast around in the middle of a two-page paragraph to find my place, although in a 300-page stretch in which Proust places under a microscope the narrator's love for his playmate, his pain when he decides to cut himself off from the girl because she doesn't love him back, his brief conversations with her parents when he visits her house at hours carefully chosen so that the girl will not be there, and hearing about his visit later will perhaps be intrigued and how Odette accessorizes the kimonos she wears when receiving guests, whether I resume exactly where I left off, inadvertently skip ahead, or reread half a page without realizing it right away is of almost no consequence. I come up the stairs and cross a wide underground space on my way to board the shuttle to Grand Central. And before I see them, I hear them, the warm, Ludic sounds evoke an involuntary smile. I follow the music to the top of the stairs, around the corner, and behind a wide pillar. I stop to soak up the feeling that rolls off these musicians. They're playing a washboard, a dulcimer, a fiddle, a tambourine, cymbals, drums, a banjo, and a bass, <coughs> though not all at once, as the <coughs> instrument to play a ratio is about two to one. Dollar bills and CDs spill out of an open guitar case. The men are wearing odds and ends reminiscent of other worlds and times. A bolo tie, a bandana, a striped railroad cap, a cowboy hat, a stocking cap pulled down low over dreadlocks. With them is a woman who wears her excess flesh like an ermine stole and passes out flyers to the sparse audience, which is constantly dispersing and replenishing itself. When she runs out of flyers or audience, she shimmies to the music in a manner that appears deeply introspective. The flyers and the handwritten sound sign propped against the instrument case announce that these are the ebony hillbillies. The men are not young. The calm they radiate is not a natural fit with Times Square at rush hour, but utterly at home in their music making, they carry it off. Their attitude captivates kindly, never rushed, each one engrossed in his own playing and simultaneously adjusting to his partners in numerous infinitesimal ways. They are doing their thing and doing it to perfection. Soon I will hasten toward the low-cost mortgages, the cappuccino bar, the Arabic lessons, the Pilates, and the raspberries with whipped cream. I am always precisely 10 minutes late, and no one in the office ever seems to notice. But for the moment, I am swept up. Where do these men live, I wonder? It's always the first question a New Yorker asks. Do they ride the A train in from Far Rockaway? Maybe they've come in from Jersey City on the PATH train? Do they have day jobs, benefits? I doubt that anyone has ever gazed admiring, admiringly at their dental insurance cards. <laughs> they play. They strum, <coughs> click, scrape, and saw. One of them taps his toes, another stamps his heel, a third does something like singing but less melodious. They do not look like the kind of street musicians who interrupt their playing to bob their heads and say, thank you, ma'am, to passers-by dropping coin, coins in their case. No, they are not that kind. 
I stand off to the side, watching and listening for as long as I can before running to make my connection. I head for the shuttle, which goes ceaselessly back and forth between Times Square and Grand Central. I have my pick of three trains on parallel tracks, numbered one, three, and four. They all go to the same place. Someone once explained to me why there's no track two, but I've forgotten the reason. There's a track two elsewhere in the system, but it peters out before reaching Times Square, something like that. I clutch the little volume in one hand, preparing to open it and regain my place mid-sentence. Behind me, the men, did they grow up together somewhere in East Tennessee? Did their group coalesce in a bar in Brooklyn before Brooklyn was hip? Are they Harlem born and bred? Are still at it. On the shuttle, I'll read one more page, maybe two if I recognize all the words about Odette and the ladies who come to her Wednesday afternoons and discuss where they have their dresses made, or about a brothel where the madam always urges Marcel to try out a Jewish prostitute with messy hair. She's better educated and a better conversationalist than the others, says the madam, and Marcel always demurs. No, thank you. Maybe next time. I'll get off the shuttle at Grand Central with the other passengers and traverse the station's cathedral-like expanse. There are easier, faster routes to work, but a day that brings with it a sense of awe, head tilted to take in that vast space, is a day not yet entirely lost. I will admire the pearly-faced clock that anchors the center of the grand hall, go down a narrow marble-floored passage where vendors sell grilled Hawaiian tuna, peppercorn sausage, cheeses that verge exquisitely on the fowl, mangoes, bananas, foster cupcakes, whatever they are, tiramisu cake, and other treats with names fancy beyond recall, wrapped in crinkly paper or packed in bright tins and dripping with snob appeal. I will emerge from underground into the city and the shadow of the green glass building. I cannot hear the music anymore. That's all, folks. I'll be happy to take questions about anything I just read or said or anything about the book. Well, I have to ask, did you ever finish Proust? Sorry, what? Did you ever finish Proust? Did I ever finish Proust? I am finishing Proust. I'm still finishing Proust. Uh, I'm on volume four. Um, I was reading volume one in 07, I think. So I put it down for years at a time. And the last time I put it down, I decided I should reread the parts that I had read in French. I should reread them in English as a memory job. Um, so that took a year. Um, and now I'm on volume four. Seems like you learned French at a later age and not you know, in school. Correct me if I'm wrong. How is that experience? Um, Harder, like what were your resources? What were my sources? Resources. Resources. Well, I actually had a very solid foundation in French. I had taken it for five or six years in, in middle school and high school. And um, I hadn't touched it or used it in probably 20 years, but it was all there. It was just like opening a book that had been closed. The grammar was all there. I just needed to be to learn how to comprehend spoken French and add vocabulary. Um, so I, I, as a freelancer, I was able to take time to go to France and take French classes and mingle with French people. And I had a mentor who was already an interpreter at the UN who was coaching me through this process. And she told me which newspapers to read, what movies to go to, what TV shows to watch, uh, you know, go to plays. Find yourself a French-speaking boyfriend, she said to me. Um, so that was how I did it. It took about six months. Um, and it's important to note that since I was working only from French into English, I didn't have to be able to speak flawlessly or write flawlessly. I only had to comprehend flawlessly. And that's a passive skill that's much easier to, to acquire than the active skills of speaking and writing in other languages. Um, and although there's a widespread perception that it's harder to learn a language when you're an adult, I don't think that's necessarily true, especially if you've already learned a foreign language, then you have a lot of the conceptual apparatus in place 
already, and you just need to add another layer. Um, because as another speaker in this series, Noam Chomsky said, uh, I'm not quoting verbatim, but the idea is that grammar, the, the, big, the broad concepts of grammar are the same, generally the same from one language to another. And when you master those, you just have to add some unique pieces for each language. So you intrigued me with your um, untranslatable statements about books. I'm curious how you define that, or what makes a book untranslatable. What makes a book untranslatable? Well, I can only say for myself what makes a book untranslatable, because other people then went on and translated those books that I, dis that I declined to translate. I think as a translator, you have to believe that everything is translatable, otherwise you're a fraud. But as a person who knows more than one language and more than one culture, you know that it's not possible. So you have to live with that contradiction. In my, well, literary translators like to say that you can only translate those books that you fall in love with. And I didn't fall in love with any of those books that I turned down. So I guess that's the first condition because literary translation is not remunerative at all. It's the worst paid form of translation. Uh, I turned down books because there were things about them that I felt I didn't fully understand. Um, as it happens, the books that I write about here that I decided not to translate were all oral history. They did not have difficult words or idioms in them, but I felt that I would not be able to capture the unique voice of the speakers. Um, one of them contained many, many different speakers, and I didn't know how I was going to contrast them all. They all felt different, and I did a sample of a few pages, and I felt like everything that I did was correct, but there was something about it that was not right. Later, I found out that the person who had done the oral history had, in different versions of the book, she actually attributed the same passages to different speakers. So my concern, I was apparently more conscientious than she was. Um, but there are also words that are untranslatable. Um, I, somebody asked this for an interview recently. What's the word, what's a word in Russian that's untranslatable? And I answered, there was a word that I encountered on one of my first big stays in the Soviet Union when it was still the Soviet Union. The word is zastolia. The root is stol, which means table. Za, the suffix, means around. And then the last part, ia, just indicates that it's an abstract noun. So this word literally means that which goes on around a table. Um, but it means something like feast plus banquet plus all the conversation, speech making, toast, drinking, singing, and the bonds that are arising between among all the people around the table, um, and all the work that went into putting out that spread, all in one word, um, in a culture where feasting and gathering is very, very important. And it also usually signifies kind of a private family or friends event, not, not an official event. So how do you put that all into one English word? I wanted to draw a, a parallel that, that I'm a little embarrassed to make. As with many people here, I write software for a living. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about software is that it's never done. You can always go back and polish it and improve it. And um, your writing seems, your, your style of writing seems to be the same, that however much effort you put into it, however carefully you, you uh, craft it, you can always go back and change it. And how, how do you know when you're done? I know when I'm done because the deadline has passed. But, but how do you know when you're writing when you're done? How do I know when I'm done? Well, there was a French poet who said, no work of art is ever done, only abandoned. Um, I do tend to procrastinate by spending a great deal of time polishing. That's a nice word for it. Uh, Oscar Wilde said, I spent the day writing. I spent the morning putting in a comma, and then I spent the afternoon <laughs> taking it out. Um, I don't know how I'm done. I mean, for this book, there were revision deadlines. But when I was writing the pieces over the course of years, nobody was waiting for them. 
uh, I think that I was producing about 40, 35 or 40 publishable pages for many years, a tiny amount. And I guess when I just felt that I'd spent enough time polishing and I wasn't adding anything substantively new, uh, then I would stop. But they're never finished until they're bound. But, um, Raymond Carver used to get his books from his publisher, Just Published, and he would take out a pencil and start correcting. <laughs> I'm tempted to do that sometimes. Thank you very much.